Welcome everybody to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad that you're with us today to stay curious. Marty's back in the saddle here running our Streamlabs program. Hi, Marty. Hello, Mark. Chime in there. We got a good choice on this green screen here. We've got the streak shot of Crew Dragon 6 returning from space uh, at about 12. This would have been taken about 12.10 uh sunday night saturday night sunday morning that's candy space center in the back don't know who took that picture i kind of tried to find out but we used it anyway there i've got the vab right off my shoulder here and uh launch pad over there on the other side that side yeah that <laughs> side there all right so hope that you all missed us over the long holiday we missed you we're back in the saddle here we went out to the space center and saw the premiere of A Million Miles Away, the documentary uh, drama of astronaut Jose Hernandez, who went from a migrant farm worker to an astronaut. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about that movie. And we're also going to feature some of the shuttle, shuttles of the month of September. We're going to kick that off here on September 5th. No shuttles launched until... Uh, from the 1st of September through the 6th, and that's kind of unusual that we don't have a, we've got an opening there where in history, none of the 135 shuttle missions were in the air, so to speak, orbiting Earth. So, um, so we're glad to be back here. Let's, let's check it out here a little bit there. Let's go with the, um, kick it off here on Stay Curious. Of course, I want to remind everybody that we're your proud nonprofit that celebrates the birth of the American Space Museum the American Space Program right here in our museum. We call it the delivery room of our space program. And if you wish to help out our nonprofit, as you're watching on YouTube, there is a, a contribution button along the bottom down there that you can push. And they've got a uh, $5 to up to $500 you can give us just by pushing a button there or two. And thank you very much. We've used your money to improve our podcast here. We've used... Uh, some donations from the UCAC brothers to buy a microphone. We got Dave Stangy up in Michigan, bought us an electronic pieces part that we needed to put the TV and the computer together. So uh, everything goes to a good cause here at the American Space Museum. So enough of our nonprofit pledge there, but uh, let's kick it. We, do our, we got 11 beautiful shuttles of the month of uh, September. And let me grab my little notes on them here. Uh, four for Atlantis, four for Discovery, three for Endeavor, and no missions for Columbus, Columbia, or Challenger in the month of September. That that is a that's, that is a little bit uh, unusual there. Um, and there, I took the logo off there, Marty. Learned how to do that. Um, on the and we're going to talk about that here a little in depth here in just a minute. But uh, we've got a total of uh, 65 astronauts, five women. And would you know it that 47 of those 65 flyers are in space on the same day in history. Okay, not the same day, of course. But if we could take a time machine back on uh, around the 16th of the month, we've got more than uh, 47 astronauts can say they were floating around Earth on those days there. So... There you go. Let's uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the the movie. A Million Miles Away, Michael Pena, Pena uh, was in The Martian, I'm told. I'm not a big Hollywood uh, movie buff, Marty. That's there after like 1960 or 1970. I don't know too much about the movies. But this was a very impressionable screening at Kennedy Space Center. Today, Marty and I went uh, there. Uh, uh, we had um, a, a Hazel went with us, our volunteer, <laughs> Connie McDaniel, and uh, uh, Anita. Yeah, Anita Truex went with us, our office manager there. Gary Folsom. And Gary Folsom was there. Hey, Gary. And uh, we all came out of there feeling real positive. It's really kind of like a Hallmark movie, all about the family. Uh, Jose Hernandez was a migrant worker. Uh, he had uh, three other siblings. I think he was the oldest, was he, or was there an older daughter? I'm pretty sure he was the oldest. Yeah. And uh, 
it's the Hispanic culture working in the migrant fields of Los, of the California area. Uh, and this happens to everybody. I was a migrant worker myself in Ohio as a summer job, uh, picking cucumbers and detasseling corn up there in the, the bread belt of America in Ohio. Anyway, Michael Pena does a great job. Uh, Rosa Salazar is his wife, if you know her. Uh, the guy that played Rick Stutko, the astronaut Marty, that was Garrett Dillahunt. He had a good role to play, didn't he? And I'm going to ask Marty to chime in any time here because we w we wanted to just share with you that we enjoyed it. Uh, Eric Johnson's another actor that was the engineering boss. Uh, and uh, when his father is instrumental in inspiring him, though Marty and I will take qualms that it's not exactly like the book that Jose wrote, uh, how his dad laid out the, uh, Jose's dream in front of him at the kitchen table instead of how to, how it uh, occurred in the in the movie, but uh, migrant workers. His dad told him as they looked out, uh, leaving the migrant workers seemed to go work uh, and live permanently in Stockton. Was it California? Yeah, Stockton. Stockton. Uh, his dad said, "This may not be your future, but it will always be your past." And I kind of like that line. Uh, he applied for astronaut. 12 times all right and the last time the movie shows he actually went to uh johnson space center and handed his re his resume to uh astronaut Stutkow, who was the chief of the of office at the time we'll ask him when we see him marty says if that actually happened and then he becomes good friends here's one of the rejection letters i took off uh dear applicant we regret to inform you you weren't chosen he wadded him up and he kept them all and uh it's a very good drama very good family drama you'll have some tears in your eyes is is, is very emotional uh as the hispanic culture i think is so so beautifully portrayed there of the family and and uh uh and it's just a i, I had a, a great feeling about that uh marty you had a correction that i want marty to share with you there about the movie that we found a glaring error that i mean this is hollywood but they shouldn't do it yeah there were a few minor errors and most were really transparent but the big one was the astronauts or the astronaut candidates are not notified by mail they usually get a call from uh, uh, george abbey or the uh, head of the nasa office and then it gets followed up by a letter so when in the movie, it shows him receiving the letter, and he's surprised and upset. Well, in reality, he already knew he was rejected when he got that letter. Yeah. I didn't think that through, Marty, until you mentioned that. There's the real Jose Hernandez with Marty when we met him. Uh, that was back in the uh, spring, I think, Marty. Uh, he's got a vineyard now, sells a wine, Terra Luna wine vineyard, and... We are efforting a wine tasting here at the museum with Jose there. One of my qualms about the movie was that uh, they didn't have uh, the star, Michael Pena, didn't have a mustache. And uh, that's kind of a big right of manhood, particularly in the Hispanic culture there. And I think uh, Jose's always had one. But, uh, you know, he's got to be pleased with this movie, Marty. It's just... Uh, uh, really a great guy when we talked to him a couple times we went out and saw him uh, he was really good friends with uh, astronaut Colt Nachala who lost her life in Colombia that shows shows that very plainly in there and she passed on to Jose and I would like to ask him if this actually happened she told him that tenacity is a superpower and because uh, he was trying to be a uh, he was already accepted as an astronaut, but he was light years behind everyone else, as it said in the movie. And then uh, he stepped up his game and flew on STS-128, took our friend Nicole Stodd up to the International Space Station. He always uh, also flew with another Hispanic astronaut, Oliva, uh, in there. And they didn't at all touch about that. But uh, there's his book, From Farm Worker to Astronaut, My Path to the Stars. I really enjoyed it. And uh, I'll watch it again on Amazon is where it's going to be shown, uh, which is an NBC outlet. Maybe someday it'll be on the NBC regular station. But uh, 
kudos to Jose Hernandez in the production of this. I particularly like the uh, the art direction. The thought is very well done visually. Uh, some uh, using the migrant hands and the, all his family working in the fields with bandages on their fingers, and then he looks at his hands while he's about to go to space. And uh, a lot of good moments in there. Marty, you got anything to add? To a million miles away, we want you to see that movie. No, it's just a very enjoyable movie. Um, needs to be a lot of historical fact there. And there is a little bit of a Hollywood, uh, what do you call it? Uh, can't think Embellishment. Of the word. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it was very minor. It's really very, Yeah, it really was. Very and, good uh, story. Uh, and, of course, you'd have to be behind the scenes like Marty to know that you couldn't look out the the astronaut quarters and see the rocket launch. That's a scene in there that the, his wife apparently uh, couldn't stand the stress of it. I forget how many times that was delayed, but it, but they had they alluded to the uh, scrubs in there. But just a, we're, we enjoyed it. Again, we were privileged to go out there as annual pass holders at Kennedy Space Center, and they had it only two pass holders. Uh, a small but appreciative crowd was there. So, yes, a question, Marty. Yeah, uh, Neil1030 is asking, will the film be shown in theaters? And I think you just mentioned it will be on Amazon. Correct. It's on Amazon Prime as, as an Amazon movie. I don't believe it's uh, to be shown in theaters. It's theater worthy for sure. It, I think it goes beyond kind of the TV docudrama in many ways and uh but this is really a you know they get the, the it's a very family oriented movie and you get the sense of it, uh in fact not even a quarter of it uh is he an astronaut so uh but he was a smart guy and he had to prove himself and yes they touch upon that that he was hispanic and that uh there's a scene in there where he's definitely uh mistaken uh, for a uh, uh, a job that would be stereotyped for Hispanics. I'm not going to give that away. But uh, anyway, a, a very uh, very touching movie, and I think it drives the point home, too, about whatever you want to do in life, don't get off of that. You can be who you want to be. Uh, I love uh, what Sally Ride said. You can't see, you can't be what you can't see. And that is all that Jose Hernandez saw it was that he wanted to be an astronaut and it took him 30 years of dreaming to do it so we recommend the movie it is a, a million miles away so thank you Marty for your contribution there there you are with the man there we can't wait to see him hope he's out there this this uh, winter all right there's the beautiful streak shot uh, cameras open for about two minutes probably to go across I did not get out and see it I saw a beautiful rocket launch off the Cocoa Beach on a Sunday night, but uh, didn't go out and see this uh, landing. Started watching on, uh, forgot about it actually, till I, I go, oh, man, it's after 12 o'clock. And put on the NASA channel, and there you saw them bobbing in the ocean. Well, I saw it landing in the infrared lights and so forth. It being uh, the uh, crew uh, dragon. Uh, Endurance, the fourth trip to space for this, Marty. Uh, that's a stat that I'll bet people don't know. This is a four-time used spacecraft, okay? And they don't even take it back to the garage to touch it up uh, with paint, I don't think. All those scorch marks. But there you see the crewmen there. Uh, I don't think you watched it, Marty. If you watched any replays, uh, it, it landed. And then the recovery ship uh, takes it about a half an hour to reach it. They were on deck within a half an hour and out of the capsule an hour after splashdown. Pretty good quick work by the SpaceX team. But boy, was it bobbing on the seas there. They had the, the, the picture of it. And I would just be vomiting like crazy. Maybe they were. Even the macho Apollo astronauts confessed that they had their barf bag handy when they landed in the ocean there because you can't stop your stomach from rolling. But boy, was it going back and forth. But it's just amazing. This thing flew in space, orbiting the Earth, then docked to the International Space Station for six months, all right? A reusable spaceship docked to the space station for almost six months, and it comes back no problems at all. And uh, then they're going to redo it and get ready to go again. So uh, 
kudos to SpaceX for perfecting crewed space travel here in early 21st century. This was the 11th crewed flight for SpaceX. And, uh, of course, the astronauts were uh, the uh, Russian on board to the left. You had Woody Hobaugh. You had um, Steve Bowen, uh, the commander on his third flight. And you had the Sultan uh, from uh, United Arab Emirates. And like the Sultan said, we all went up as uh, astronauts and friends, and we came back as brothers. And uh, that was kind of emphasized a little bit in the movie, Marty, that you go to space, you're, everybody suddenly changes at the, their attitude that now we have to help each other survive in this worst hostile environment of all time. So uh, I've never really commented about the SpaceX suits there, Marty. I, I like them, except I think the the boots are way too much. Uh, that, that's uh, They just need ankle boots, I think. They don't need the calf boots, do they? Really? <laughs> But it was fun to watch them extract them. I got mesmerized by it. If you did too, they actually took out the, the, the seat uh, foot pad uh, holders there to make it easier to get them all out. Plenty of room in that thing. They had two doctors in there checking them out while they're still in their seats there. So uh, kudos to them. Glad that they're back. I tried to find a picture of them in Houston and, and hadn't yet. So also in space news history today is uh, the mission's over for the India rover, Pragnan, and uh, the uh, lander is, is not working either because they went into the darkness of the lunar night. So uh, there's one of the last pictures of it. You can see a little video where it does a little circle around, kind of triumphant circle, and then they park it so that the solar panel is going to face the sun when those first rays of sunlight hit the South Pole in about two weeks. Yes, question, Marty, or comment? Yeah, I got a question from Bill Whiting. Could you hear the sonic boom along the Space Coast when Crew 6 returned? Good question, Bill. No, nobody heard it. We were too far away here, but I know some people up in the uh, uh, St. Augustine area said they heard it uh, up there. Marty, did you hear any reports of it? No, I haven't heard anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Marty gets up at five in the morning, so when they have a morning launch, he'll hear he'll he'll be giving you the report there. But uh, but no, it it was uh, that good question, Bill. No, we did not hear the uh, the boom, but uh, they heard it up as this uh, landed off of Jacksonville in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, what a nice setup! Whether it's in the Gulf of Mexico by Pensacola Naval Base or over in Jacksonville, where there's a big naval base, they got it covered. So. Uh, uh, and and like I said, I got fascinated watching the whole whole situation with the SpaceX team uh, handling this spaceship. Uh, you know, like I said, orbiting the Earth, docked to a space station six months, then it's floating and bobbing like a gumdrop on the or marshmallow there on the ocean surface. Quite quite a vehicle. And uh, yes, we right. So no more of the India rover. Okay. Uh, they don't think it will survive. It might. It's going to get 200 below zero. And, uh, uh, and you know, it could, they're just unexperienced with all where their technology survived the winter. Russia had several lunar rovers that did survive the two week night of a moon cycle. They have uh, two weeks of daylight and two weeks of uh, night. Uh, as it goes around the earth every 28 and a half days. So there's the little rover. Uh, we'll let you know in a month if it's going to survive. But it did all of its accomplishments in that two-week period. They got everything done. Uh, and they think that they've got a place where they can send more lunar landers to start creating a an, a, an autonomous base. That's what China wants to do is create a robotic base first at the South Pole of the Moon, harvest some of that water that's under these craters in ice, and then make bricks, Lego bricks, out of the lunar soil and the water there. That's what China wants to do uh, around 2028. So things are happening at the bottom of the moon. Where's the moon now? Well, the moon's going to be rising about 1130 tonight. Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, it'll be first quarter later in the week, and then it'll be new moon 
so the moon is out of the evening sky for a while and we'll end the show with telling you to get out and see the milky way perfect time of year to see it weather's breaking and it is spectacular so well we got the india on our mind and this is a newspaper clip uh that uh uh uh, Connie McDaniel sent me this sunshine moment as India launches a mission to study star and in the newspaper headline I'm scratching my head going star what's what star is it going to study it's going to take a uh, hundred years to get to the nearest star uh, at, at, at ten times the speed we can go now uh, it take a thousand years to get to the nearest star quite frankly or longer that stars the sun India has sent a good new mission to the sun to study uh, some of the surface features and so forth like hasn't been done from space so good for them India's space program is on a roll and uh, Russia's isn't after their failed Luna 25 uh, mission uh, heads have been rolling at Roscosmos it's been a serious uh, hurt in the Russian pride that they didn't that their rover didn't work on the moon and India did so uh, watch India as, as a big, uh, up and coming player. They're getting a little criticism because of the spending money on space and the poverty in the country. Well, we've heard that before. And if you don't go to space, how are you going to create the means for, to get out of poverty? You've got to educate your masses and you've got to have programs of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math for those kids to learn and and uh, work themselves out of poverty. All right, we're going to step back in space history a little bit here on today's mashup. Uh, when I uh, had the word mashup, Marty goes, what's mashup mean? And I think he was hoping it had something to do with some potatoes, right, Marty? <laughs> no. no. I was hoping it's a movie mash. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yes, we can't find anything spacey about mash. Uh, in there. Well, on this date in space history, September 5th, 1977, a Titan III E rocket uh, with a Titan second stage blasted off Earth for the outer planets Jupiter, which it encountered in July 79, two years later, and Saturn, uh, three years later in November 1980. Now more than 15 billion miles from Earth, four times the distance of Pluto. 46 years later, Voyager 1 is still phoning home. It takes 22 hours for a radio signal to go from Voyager across the void of space to Earth. And uh, it's still going 30, almost 40,000 miles an hour is the most distant object ever launched from Earth. How many objects, Marty, are left the solar system or leaving the solar system that we have... Uh, launched of all the satellites we've launched there's only a handful that are leaving the solar system i'll tell you how many in a minute here marty you think about that that spacecraft someday maybe ten thousand years from now maybe a million years from now will survive and on it will be these two discs that were put in a case with a needle to play the picture disc the left disc is a bunch of physics that a intelligent creature would figure out the carbon atom at the bottom. You've got some radioisotope stuff going on there. You've got uh, uh, kind of a uh, uh, electromagnetic spectrum laid out there for them. People would understand maybe what this is all about if they got it. And then they'd take that needle. We didn't put a turntable in there with them. They'll have to figure that out. And the sounds and sights of Earth there on that LP long plane gold disc. This was the brainchild of uh, Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan was the popularizer of astronomy in the 1970s. Uh, think Neil deGrasse Tyson, who's a popularizer of that now, the planetarium director in New York City. Neil deGrasse Tyson does a great job talking to the masses about uh, the complexities of space. And uh, I'm sure you've probably seen him do some things. Um, just, I mean, I think someday, Marty, creatures will intercept this spacecraft. There is five spacecrafts leaving the solar system. Uh, four of them have left. 
Pioneer, they were launched about five years before Voyagers, and then the Voyagers were launched in pairs in case one failed, all right? You see, Pioneer took a right turn as we sent it uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to Saturn, <clears throat> and also uh, Voyager was sent to Saturn and then down, it's, it's exited out the bottom of the solar system, so to speak, because we sent it by the moon Titan, uh, and that created a trajectory different from Voyager up there at the top. Looking down, a map looking down on this, uh, once again, you see that all of them are above the plane except Voyager 2 is going in an entirely di different direction. And we know what part of space these could be found in. Okay, Voyager 1 is going towards Sagittarius, the center of our galaxy. And that, that where there's more stars, so it has a greater chance uh, to be intercepted by intelligent creatures. And uh, there's, uh, oh, that's kind of funky over that. <clears throat> These missions were done in the 70s because they took advantage of a rare alignment that happened every 200 years of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune being in a line that gravity assist could go by them. Although Voyager 2 went by uh, uh, Uranus and Neptune. Voyager 1 did not. <clears throat> and there's an artist's rendering of the spacecraft. And uh, big Star Trek movie made over uh, V'ger uh, being found by civilizations. That was one of the first tar uh, Star Trek movies uh, has that. So uh, the gold disc, uh, again has uh, Wolfgang Mozart, Blind Willie Nelson, Chuck Berry on there, along with other Western, 50 classics, 55 languages, all right? And uh, yet someday, if found by intelligent life, they will know all about planet Earth. Well, something of this Earth. Who is this, Marty? Got a guess? No. That is Werner von Braun. The, at age 56, the six foot one inch tall Marshall Space Flight Center director on September 4th, 1968, performed a full pressure test suit test uh, in a Saturn V workshop immersed in the neutral buoyancy tank at, where, at Marshall Center. This test was for Skylab project in a future space station. Okay, this was 1968, still dreaming of the man orbiting laboratory and after being submerged in the arrowhead products pressure suit von braun reported that the upgraded seals used in the aft dome penetrated penetration sealing study were very good and he recommended additional handholds and tether points on the outside of skylab something that all the space stations after employed on there so there's von braun in the water tank as the director there and um oh i didn't put the picture of oh yeah this picture of him there that's astronaut gordon cooper with his hand checking the fabric out there he'd already been in space twice and he was uh there to see this test von braun had done a tank test before on this uh and you gotta love a guy that uh look uh, i'll do what the what the workers are doing what the worker bees are doing though i'm the the head of this place, uh, give me a sp give me a space suit and put me in the tank. So, uh, von Braun also uh, was no stranger to the vomit comet. There he is up there, uh, and uh, I like that about the guy Marty that that he was hands on, and you know Marty of all the space worker famous people that you and I have heard about, some of them you've even worked for. Uh, this is a universally beloved leader, okay? There are great stories from the worker bees of him coming down to the lunch cafeteria at Marshall and sitting down arbitrarily with the gang and, and eating his meal with them. Uh, and Marty, you and I have talked a lot about some of the muckety mucks, as, as some of y'all call them. Uh, some of them, yeah, they they worked the hands a little bit of some of their workers, but they didn't get in the back row, right, Marty? And uh, so, uh, but uh, what, what, you got a comment about Von Braun and my enthusiasm for his hands-on approach. 
Nope, sorry, I don't. Okay, all right. Well, I don't want to get you in trouble with any of those old muckety mucks either. But it's true. Uh, so you'd be kind of be surprised at some people that just didn't uh, stay out, uh, that didn't get down to the the shirt sleeve workers in there. But this guy did. So, uh, and that's why the whole program was a big success. Well, let's look at some of these shuttles of, uh, and we'll look at them all month. You know, that's a future feature that we love to do on Stay Curious is honor our shuttle program like none other. Uh, we're glad today we got uh, Jerry, Gary Gerald watching, uh, Doug Forrest, Bill Whiting, Neil 1030, Tom Usiak, and Carlton Bailey watching today. We appreciate that, guys, following us, guys and girls that are watching us today. Well, Space Shuttles of September, like I told you, 11 total. It's weird that Columbia and Challenger didn't have any flights at all. We've got uh, two Mir missions there. Um, and uh, let's see, which, which one? Well, let me look at my chart here. The Mir missions are, of course, 79 and uh, 69. I think it was a rendezvous. You got two ISS hard hat missions uh, where they did a lot of work on there. That'd be... Uh, and then you've got uh, five science payloads. Okay, this is actually a light month for, for hard hats. You got 106 and 115 uh, up there, the far top right, and then the second one in. But five science payloads, a Tedris mission uh, was launched, and one Space Lab J. And that would be the Japan Space Lab in the middle there, STS 47 with the uh, first African-American female, Mae Jameson, there. You had an important return to flight after Challenger, STS-26, happened in the month of September 1988. We will be talking about that. And uh, Mikey Haddad has already told me, Marty, he's going to feature STS-68, the uh, SRL, the radar mission that uh, has did such a topographic radar of our earth that that is what is on your google earth products out there is what this sts 68 did 1994 uh that that data is still being used today so uh, uh the upper atmosphere research satellite sts 48 there the triangle in the middle left that's important baseline of what we know now about our global climate uh situation there so uh, we're going to enjoy looking at these shuttles of the month of september a little more in depth of course as we always do on stay curious uh now get porter von braun flying up there uh this uh is actually a mistake that i put in there shuttles of september now marty i couldn't find my notes on this but i do have an ulterior motive here is we have a bunch of five albums Five different shuttle missions. What would those albums have in common? Songs, right? So these are the wake-up songs of these missions all on one day in September. So stay curious because we will find out what wake-up songs. We could guess Lady in the... The, uh, the Lady is a Tramp, maybe? Uh, what would be, uh, is, would be the song off Lady and the Tramp? How about the song off Hotel California? Uh, that STS-115 woke up to. Uh, maybe Life in the Fast Lane. Uh, Perry Como. That's probably a, a, a alludes to a star or something. And the uh, what marching band does that say? University of Connecticut yep. marching band. And then you've got the uh, upper left, the Bare Necessities, okay, from Jungle Book. So... Uh, stay curious, and we'll tell you what date and what songs were played as wake-up calls to the astronauts. We used to play the wake-up calls, Marty, but we got busted for that uh, on YouTube. We don't know how to make it not a bunch of sirens go off like we're ripping them off. We thought you had 20 seconds you could have a bumper music with. But anyway, so we'll tease you with that. Stay curious. Wake-up songs on what day of September were, and what songs off these five albums. So... Well, at first this might look like, oh, no, this looks like a crazy chart. And it is. At the bottom is the days of the month. 
at the top left are the number of shuttles launched, 11 shuttles in the entire month. But as you see, the first six days of September are blank, no shuttles at all. This is quite an anomaly. Actually, I don't think the 31st of August had a space flight or anybody in orbit, all right? Usually there is someone in orbit on this time in history, uh, on any given date, uh, something's orbiting in the shuttle. And of course, if you go to the Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, you could probably fill in a blanks. But first month, first week of September, no shuttles were flying in the air. But then you look on the uh, 16th, and you have one, two, you've got 69, 106, 64, 115, 48, 47, 51, and 79 are all orbiting the Earth from uh, STS-79's launch on the 16th to the landing of 69 on the 18th. So you got three full days that you've got 47 astronauts on eight shuttles can say, I was in orbit on the 15th, 16th, 17th. And uh, that's quite a lot of astronauts. 47 out of this month's total, 65 astronauts. Uh, all of them were orbiting except, uh, uh, would that be 10? 15 of them. Uh, so 16 of them. So I think that's pretty cool to look at there. And this is something, a work in progress that uh, is an easy, cheap, cheap for someone to talk about and look about the shuttles of September uh, and uh, look for that to be improved by our executive director, Karen Conklin, and myself tackling that little project there. So that kicks off our shuttles of the month here of September and uh, gets us out of our Labor Day yawns and, and, uh, 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 rejuvenated to get into the, the season this time. So I want you all to get in the season and get outside uh, the next couple nights. Uh, it gets dark now around 8 o'clock. Sunset's right before 8 o'clock. So twilight's done about 8.30. Uh, if it, we've had some beautiful, cool, low humidity nights here the last couple days in Florida, and I've been outside just getting a little bit of starlight and seeing the Milky Way looking like a smoke coming up off of the horizon there. My friend Mark Poole going out to the Herky Huffman Park. We've got to get far away. There's really no dark sights at all in Florida. I'm not going to tease anybody by saying it's really dark like the Appalachian Mountains where I spent 35 years. But, uh, in fact, that light over there is um, uh, Orlando, you see on the distance in there. But great shot by Mark Cool to show you what the Milky Way can look like. Uh, you're looking right at the center of the galaxy. There are some other clouds in there, too. You obviously can tell the difference from the real clouds. And then here's a close-up he took. I got a tree right there behind me looking right into Sagittarius and the heart of the Milky Way there. So uh, Mar uh, Marina R is watching from the Ukraine. Thank you, Marina. Hope you're well. And Nick Sedler's watching. Nick, glad that you're watching today, too. So uh, we've got a, a good week lined up for you, a good short week. But we are going to um, have a legend of the Apollo program. Mr. John Tribe will be on the show tomorrow. John is a hypergolic expert with North American Rockwell. And he also is involved not just with the Apollo command module, but the space shuttle also. You're going to like one of the first British engineers to come over uh, and help uh, with Apollo, Mr. John Tribe. Uh, indeed, uh, a great person. Uh, and John and I went over his program last week. You're going to enjoy learning, Marty. You're going to learn a little bit about how John grew up as a boy in the Blitzkrieg of World War II and how Werner von Braun uh was his enemy at one point in time uh and then uh working for the of course von braun with the v2 rockets and in penamunda and then he remembers walking out with the great von braun after a scrub of a rocket launch and saying a few words to each other so you're going to enjoy mr john tribe uh tomorrow on stay curious and friday we've got uh ralph uh, uh 
Oh, Ralph's last name. I just forgot. Ralph worked for Grumman 30 years ago on a radioactive spacecraft to go to Mars in about six weeks. Ralph Palmer will be our guest looking back at the past of nuclear reactors and spacecraft in the future on Future Friday this week. So, Marty, you got something else to add? No, not really. I just already knew the story about John Tribe, so I'm not going to learn it. Oh, what's that? <laughs> About I John? Said, I already knew the story about John. Oh, you already know the stories about John, so you're not going to learn anything new? All right. No, well, of course not. You're, uh, uh, though you're a lot, you're younger than John, you still worked in that same uh, arena of the Apollo going to the moon on there. Some fascinating stories from John Tribe tomorrow. You're gonna, not going to want to miss that. So thank you all for watching today. Thank you for a good Streamlabs program. There, we look at all of your comments after the show, so if we didn't get to you, we will. Uh, we appreciate you watching on YouTube. All those comments on live, we don't see a lot of those at that time, but Marty's reading them there. So thank you for reaching out to us all, and thank you for telling your friends to stay curious with us here at the American Space Museum. Until tomorrow with the Apollo legend, Mr. John Tribe, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us.